Okay. Hello, John. How are you? Hundred thousand, hundred thousand, hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. Hundred thousand. This will help you. Okay, thank you. I walk around with that in my little bag. Oh, John gives me it, and then I just don't know what to do with it. It's the money guy. <laughs> I just, I don't want to talk to you. Okay, you take the money from me. Okay. Someone's strategy is free. But ask the task. Yeah, if you want to talk to them, just if they were to sell, what would you do with the money? They buy another property. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, I have a cash buyer that has a lot of cash looking to buy property. Um, have you been have you considered selling this? If you were to sell it, would you? If you and then you say no, I'm not selling. It's like well, if you were to sell it, the offers are not. If you were to sell it, what would you? Say? Buying the property, which is uh, cash right now. Uh, of course. It's um, that conversation. Ten percent is, and will be for the number that he was on. I mean, that's what you need. You need a number else on. Do you know how to get them? Okay, I can help. I can help with that right now. Because it's cheap. Property management, yeah. but they care about the check and okay. everything. Okay. Okay. I've got one number I'm guessing. Okay. Okay. I was there for three hours, but he didn't show up. If you, if you email me the address, yeah. I'll see what I can do about contact information. Okay, I'll have all this thing. I'll okay. send you the property report. So I, no, no, I just need, I just need the address so I can look at the owner and see what I can find for contact Because if they have it since 1971. Oh, they've had it since 71? Yeah, but the parents have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so someone who's owned a property for so long, someone who's owned a property for so long um, is going to have, the, it's first, of, it's a cash cow, because there's no, there's no debt in the property, right? That's just cash. That's and they make, I think, around 20000 a month yeah. from the rent. So, <laughs> all right. That's that's just, <laughs> I don't know. So usually properties that have been owned for so long are usually sold um, when someone passes away and there's family. And it. So what the kids might want to sell it so they can divide up the asset. Yeah, but this happened already. This happened. How long ago? Passed away a few years ago. Two years ago. So they've been talking about it. We still have. Can I say that we have all the stuff that's been trouble? This thing has been changed the management. But now, just I feel like I was there. That's the thing. We cannot make that 20,000 at least. I can get you the contact. This is elevate. You're going to elevate now. We're going to elevate. We're going to elevate. Elevating. How high are we going to go? Yes. Um, three drops. Yes. Let's remember to ask Zoom. Yeah. Oh. Full. That way. Oh, why they're on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, why are they on Zoom? Okay. It's online. It's online. Okay. Thanks, guys. Nice to meet you. That's fine. Oh, <laughs> no. Do you know of any service that does like personalized? 
Gift mailing. Personalized gift mailing. Yeah. Like a little trinket, something to like stay in touch. There are there are companies like that that advertise that that have boats at um, family reunion and mega camp. So I don't know. So I, you could probably Google it. Uh, maybe if you go on. Have you used any of them? I have not used for gifts. I mean, there's Cutco knives and there's. I'm talking about like small, small things. Ten, twenty dollar gifts that you send every quarter. Uh, Just gonna keep in mind. So I, I know that there are companies like that who are. When you go to family reunion, they have like a giant auditorium. They're trying to sell stuff to us agents. So. What <laughs> time you have to go? So that's either going to be Anaheim Convention Center. It's going to be in, I think, in Dallas and in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. It's New Orleans. Uh, it's the same place every year they wrote it. But it's pretty, pretty awesome. Vegas, Vegas is a good one. Now that AC is working. Uh, yeah, all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so the people on Zoom, I'm supposed to ask the people on Zoom. Why they're on Zoom and not in, in class? Anyone on Zoom want to want to tell us why you're on Zoom and not here? Anybody? Because I'm sick. Because you're sick. That's a good reason. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not in town. Anyone else? Uh, I... Doctor's orders. <laughs> doctor's orders. Okay. <laughs> I will. I'm on Zoom because I'm everyone's favorite by coastal realtor, and I'm in Florida right now. <laughs> that makes sense. What part of Florida? So I'm in uh, Port St. Lucie. It's on the Treasure Coast, just north of Palm Beach. Wow, beautiful. Oh, you got your address. You come visit. <laughs> yeah, I have a I have an open house this weekend. Come on by. <laughs> oh, you say Florida or Florida? <laughs> Listen. I'm a Miami native, Florida native, so it's Florida, okay? okay? <laughs> oh, my whole family's from New York, and they say Florida. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. um, anyone else while you're on Zoom? I'm I'm over in at Lake Las Vegas, and so I actually just finished another referral. So I've been really busy because people want to move here for a vacation home or whatever, uh, and I will be in the office in two weeks again <laughs> okay great great so i can tell you just from my personal experience now because i've i've during covid i went home working from home the office was closed um it was it was like dismal around here there was nobody here and working from home was great i walked my dogs all the time they really miss me now um <laughs> But there's so many distractions at home, and you're not talking real estate all the time at home. Um, it's so good just to get back into an office environment and people are around talking real estate. Um, you're hearing phone conversations as you walk by desks of real estate. It's just, it's good to get back into the game mentally um, and physically, like just being home in front of your computer. So anyways, I, I, we, we, I, was, I was in a meeting with Serena and Josh and they were saying like, JJ, find out why people are on Zoom. Like why, why? So that's all, just wanted to ask why. So most of you are either sick or not around locally. Okay. You're watching your TV today and you just want your charm. Oh, people are watching the news. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't want to get political. Yeah, um, horrible road. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're talking about the buyer process. The buyer process. So I just want to have a conversation with you guys. So don't don't worry about taking notes. I, I just want to have a conversation about buyers. Okay, because you, everyone that you talk to as a buyer. They just need to understand the process. It's, it's that's that's really it. Um, so, as far as a buyer goes, they need to have enough money for a down payment. They need to find a house that they like. 
or a condo they like. Make an offer on it, hopefully get it accepted with your help and close escrow. That's it, they bought a property, okay? Now, the buyer is gonna have a lot of fears um, and then we are gonna guide them through that process. Okay, so the biggest thing I hear from a buyer that what buyers wanna know is if they put it, their deposit into escrow, are they gonna lose their deposit if there's something that they find out they don't like about the property? That's the biggest fear I have gotten feedback on from agents asking me like that. So, so basically a buyer has zero risk of making an offer on a pro. I don't, gosh, when I say zero, like I'm being recorded and uh, <laughs> a buyer has extremely, extremely low risk by making an offer on a property, getting it accepted and putting their money into escrow while they have contingencies. Okay, so there's three contingencies. Now you're gonna have, you're gonna, you guys are gonna have to explain contingencies to your buyer. Okay, what's a contingency? A contingency is a reason to back out of a deal without losing your deposit. That's what a contingency is. So you have three contingencies. You have your investigations, which can be anything you find out during your inspection period. Okay. Anything your buyer finds out during your inspection period, they can use this as an excuse to back out. Now, re remind me what I, that I just said that because we need to get back to it. We, want it. we need to do it properly. Okay? And there's a way to do that properly. Um, the other, so you have your investigation contingency, you have your loan contingency, and your appraisal contingency. Those are the three things. Investigation, loan, and appraisal. So let's talk about the appraisal contingency. Um, if you are buying a house for cash and not getting a loan, you don't really need an appraisal contingency if you, you know, I mean, you know, so if you're a buyer making a cash offer on a property and, you're, and your agent is showing you comps of what similar sales have been, do you need an appraisal contingency? Are you the buyer going to order an appraisal if you're making a cash offer? Yes, sir. Yes and no. I don't know. Some Maybe some, some people do. So, okay, so an, appraisal, an appraisal is one person's opinion of value. The appraiser is the appraiser's opinion. One percent on it. No, no, I'm saying the 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 appraisal is one person, the appraiser, one person, that okay. person's opinion of the value of the property. That's the one person's opinion. Now, most appraisals come back at the contract price. So the, the appraiser just needs to make sure that the property is worth what it is being sold. That's the appraiser's job. They're protecting, they're usually protecting the lender. This is what an appraiser is. It's a third party opinion that protects the lender, right? So let's say I have a friend, Greg, right? And Greg owns a property worth a million dollars. And I say, hey, Greg, I'm gonna make you a $3 million offer. We're gonna get, I'm gonna get a loan and we're gonna run away with the money, okay? It's only worth a million, but I'm gonna get a $3 million loan on it. I'm gonna make a contract for 3 million. You're gonna accept it. I'm gonna get a loan. And um, we'll, we'll run away, you know, I'll give you your million and then we'll split the other two million, right? And I'll get a million. Okay, you'll get a million, I'll get a million. That's great. Not really, that's fraud, but here's the issue. Nice. The, lender, the lender is going to hire an appraiser before the loan closes. The lender needs to protect themselves. So what the lender does is they hire an appraiser that has nothing to do with the buyer and seller to protect their money, all right? If I'm, if I'm a lender and I'm lending money all over the United States, how do I know these deals are valid? Like, how do I know that the number is, do I wanna put my money on that deal? So I need an appraisal to tell me the lender if it's worth it. Most appraisals come back in value, meaning I'm in a contract with my friend Greg for a million, 
the appraisal will come back in a million. I'm in my contract. I'm in the contract for a million fifty thousand. The appraisal comes back in a million fifty thousand. Okay, that ninety something percent of the time, that's what's going to happen. It's very rare that an appraisal will come back more than the contract price. Very rare. Sometimes it'll come back under the contract price. Sometimes it won't. A little bit under. If the appraisal comes in low, the buyer can use that as an excuse to back out. That's the contingency. Okay. I made an offer to my friend Greg for a million dollars. The appraisal came back at 950. I said, Greg, I'm using, I, I, I don't want to spend 950. I know I don't want to spend a million. I'll spend 950. And Greg says, no, I want a million. So I can back out now and I can get my deposit back. And that's the appraisal contingency. Now I have the lender. The lender is looking at my assets, my income, my debt ratio. Um, what seller has to pay for the appraisal? The buyer pays for the appraisal. The buyer, the, bu the buyer because the buyer, fees. right? The buyer has buyer fees. So what are the buyer's fees? The buyer is going to have to pay for inspections. The buyer is going to have to pay for the appraisal. The buyer is going to have to pay for the lender fees, right? Because those are all buyer expenses. Um, the buyer also has to insure the lender on title. So the seller, the seller is paying for title insurance. For the buyer, right? No problem. If there's no loan, that's it. The seller pays for the title insurance for the buyer. But if I'm getting a loan from this lender, I have to insure the lender. So I pay the small title fee for the lender. So my fees as the buyer, um, I'm, I'm going to have to pay some little property tax. I'm going to have to pay insurance. I pay insurance. Uh, those are my and a lot of low fees. Inspections. <laughs> Inspections, yeah. I mean, and, and an appraisal, right? I'm going to have to, my lender's going to say, can I get your credit card number? Because I need to order the appraisal. There are some lenders that'll pay for the appraisal. There are some. They used to, maybe not anymore. So lenders really are looking for appraisal, not as. To protect themselves. To protect themselves. Now, good. Okay, so we're talking about, we're talking about. <laughs> We're talking about contingencies real quick, but the lender, if the lender gets a hold of an inspection they don't like, they could say, I'm not lending my money on this property. Right? So don't send your inspections to escrow. Ever. There's no reason, there's no reason for escrow to have your inspection. If they get them, they'll have to send them to the lender. Okay. And to the lender also, right? Don't oh, yeah. <laughs> send your inspections to the lender or escrow. No reason to. That's why you gotta work with a broker. Right. This that's our job. Our job is to make sure that doesn't happen. If the lender asks for a termite inspection, they can ask for that. But they can ask. Yeah, sure. They yeah, sure. The lender, if the lender asks for a general inspection, then you have to get it. Oh, but they won't ask, they won't ask for it. So don't provide it without them asking for it. Okay. Okay. It's really just that appraisal. They can ask for it. If I'm a lender, if I'm a private lender, I might want to ask for the inspection report. If I'm a private lender, yes. right? I want to know what I'm lending my money on. If they ask, I mean, it's very rare. They don't, they don't do it yet. <laughs> Let's start with that. They don't do it yet, uh, but they could start doing it, but they don't. So make sure you don't send inspections to escrow and, or to the lender. Um, okay, so we're talking to our buyer about contingencies now because the buy, from a buyer's perspective, they are scared. They're spending, this is the biggest purchase of their life. Any real estate transaction is, we're talking big money. Um, so they need to know that if they find anything wrong during the, during their inspection or contingency periods, they can back out and not lose their deposit. Okay, so there's a appraisal contingency. There's the loan contingency. So the lender might say, "I can't loan money on this property for whatever." There could be a million reasons. Um, as long as that contingency is in existence the buyer can back out based upon the loan contingency and not lose their deposit, okay? Inspections. Inspections mean physical inspections. So if I'm representing a buyer I'm in, and I'm talking to a buyer, like what are the inspections that we're gonna do? We're gonna do a general inspection. That's my number one most important inspection, general. The general inspector is going to go through the house, open the cabinets, check the faucets, um, you know, it's going to open all the drawers, see, it's going to look for holes anywhere. Um, it's going to check the water pressure. 
Yeah, let's check everything. Let's check everything. The, the general inspector is going to go through the entire property um, and then let me know if I need to hire specialty inspectors, meaning plumbers, electrician, that. Or, or a mold inspection, right? There are some agents who always get a mold inspection. Like some other agents might say to you, their most important inspection is the mold inspection. Yeah. There are some agents that will say that. Um, so if there's ever been water damage in a property, you should get, definitely get a mold. If you smell musty something, get a mold inspection. Uh, but usually I'm waiting for my general to tell me that there was evidence here of prior water damage or, or something's moist, then I'll get my mold inspection. Uh, but talking to a buyer about inspections, we want to do a general. Uh, if it's a house, we want to do a sewer inspection, which means they run a camera from a sewer clean out down the line to get to the city, to the city hookup. So in a house, you have incoming water from LA City, Beverly Hills, you know, it's, so you have incoming water, fresh, fresh water just applied to the house. That fresh water usually gets diverted. So fresh water comes in and it's gonna get split. The first split is the sprinklers. And then the second split goes to the water heater. And then from the water heater, there's gonna be two lines. There's gonna be a, a cold line and a hot. It goes throughout the entire house. Those are the incoming lines. Those should hopefully be copper. That's great. They might be galvanized, old, old yeah. galvanized pipes. Um, the thing with galvanized is they just, the uh, minerals collect inside them and the pipe shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks from all the mineral deposits on the pipe. So it just, it decreases, it keeps decreasing the water pressure. So if you have an old property that has very low water pressure, the pipes are just probably clogged up with, you know, build up. Um, that's the incoming water. And then you have the outgoing water, which is down the sink drains, the toilet, the showers. That is waste, waste lines. The waste lines go down plastic pipes um, and will go into the sewer line. The sewer line is a giant six inch wide pipe that goes from under the house and connects into the city sewer outside the property. The homeowner needs to inspect that pipe, the sewer pipe, to make sure that there's no cracks in it. You have cracks in the pipe, that means that there's sewage leaking into the earth. Yuck. Okay. Um, those, those sewer lines used to be made out of, so a lot are cast iron, a lot of them are clay pipe. The clay are these, they're six feet long pieces of clay and they like insert into each other every six feet. The problem is that you get trees that they get their little feeler roots that come in because roots are just looking for water. When they find water, they say all to their buddies, hey, we found water, we found water. And all the roots come in. And if the roots are left there, they get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and the pipe cracks. Yes. Okay. That's what happens. Is that the clay pop? The clay, clay. The clay. yeah, it'll, it'll crack. But it's a very thick galvanized one. Very bad part. Galvanized is incoming water. Oh, so the clay, the clay always... Hopefully you don't have roots in your incoming. Yeah, lots of houses in Bel Air, and these are old houses, yeah. they have the same issue, that every few months you have to just ask them to come and take out... Correct, the all the roots, roots. yes. Yeah. So, so any, any property that I'm helping a buyer on, I'm doing a general inspection. I'm doing a, a sewer inspection. So what? how do we do the sewer inspection? So usually outside, there's going to be a clean out. You'll see like a, a, plas a black plastic cap. They need to take that cap off and they run the camera down. Um, sometimes people call a plumber to run a snake through the line. It's, they, they come with blades and they're basically just running that down the line and they're cutting all the roots. That's, a, that's not solving the problem. That's just allowing the sewage to get down the line. Solving the problem is actually fixing the crack area so the roots don't come in anymore. So that can get expensive. You know, it's, that can get expensive. So there's different methods for doing that. We're not going to talk about that today. I'm just talking about these 
the inspections. So <clears throat> general inspection, sewer inspection, which is a camera down the sewer line. If the house has a chimney, you need to do a chimney inspection. Um, that means a camera goes up the chimney and is they're looking for places that could become flammable. So if someone is burning wood in a fireplace and uh, there's a timber ash going ignited, it, you know, if there's a piece of fire floating up the chimney, we don't want it to go and catch fire to the fireplace. So a lot of times just from over the years, the rain and weather will deteriorate the mortar inside in between the bricks. And it's a perfect opportunity for something to go out and ignite. Um, the termite companies see this all the time. Some, you know, chimney is supposed to have a sparker restaurant on top. You see that metal thing on top of the chimney? It doesn't allow sparks to fly out and catch all the trees around on fire. Um, but that's a chimney inspection. So general inspection, sewer inspection, chimney inspection. If the property has a pool, I want to do a pool inspection. Make sure the pool's not leaking. Make sure all the pool equipment's working. Um, those are the, those are the, main, and there's mold, of course, there's the mold inspection. So those are the major inspections. After the general inspection, uh, usually what happens is the general inspector at the end of his inspection will come and sit at the kitchen table. Your buyer will be present and he will go over with you what he's found at the property. Um, you're not, he's, some, some inspectors will give you the report on the spot. Those are probably not the best inspectors because they're just spitting out a report too, it's too quick. I want, I want, to, I want more than that. Um, <laughs> but inspector's gonna go home and really take his time putting a good report together that explains what's going on in the property. Can, now, okay, yeah. sorry, can someone request to do these inspections before making an offer? Yes, <clears throat> yes, you can. You have to pay for it. You have to pay for it and you're paying, you're paying now for inspections that you're not in contract. So the seller doesn't have to sell the property to you and you're paying to inspect a property you don't own and you're not in contract with, right? Now, there might be a scenario where I want to do that. Um, if I'm making, if, if there's a property, I can, I've done it. Like, so property is for sale in Beverly Hills. Uh, there, there's 30 offers on the property, 30 offers currently on the property. Seller is making a decision tomorrow or two days from now, all offers do buy, right? And I, if I want my buyer to make a non-contingent offer, all cash, non-contingent, my buyer will even go farther than that. They'll release money non-refundable to the seller if they get the deal. So they'll get the deal, all cash, no contingencies, and back out. And they'll release money to the seller non-refundable upon acceptance. Okay, that I will say to the listing agent, I want to write that type of offer. Will you let me inspect the property? Okay, my buyer is willing to spend the money on the inspections. Can I do that? Yes. Now, if you're in that scenario, you need to be present there and not let other buyers of the property talk to the inspector. And you need to tell the inspector, don't talk to other people here because you're the one paying for it. Why should, why should other people there get the benefit of talking to your inspector? And they're going to be asking him for his card. Can I get your card? Can I get your card? You got to tell the inspector, I'm hiring you to do this. And, I, and I'm hiring you not to give this information out to anybody. And that will be more common with all cash purchase. You, well, the reason you're doing this is to have the seller pick you and not anyone else. You want to have the best offer. If, this, if I have an offer as a seller that they can't back out and they're releasing money to me, non-refundable, if I go, I know they're doing the deal. The risk to a seller is they pick a buyer that backs out. They have 30 people interested and all of a sudden someone backs out. Now everyone's like, whoa, why did that, why did they back out? What's wrong with the property? What did they discover? Now there's fear, yeah. right? It's, to a seller, it's very important to pick a buyer that's going to do the deal. All right. Um, okay. So we talked about inspections that those are, the buyer is going to pay for those. That's the inspection period. The buyer can back out at any time if they find out something that they don't agree with, right? They can back out and get their deposit back. So three contingencies, appraisal, loan, investigation. 
inspection, right? Those are the three contingencies. So you you guys are going to have conversation with your buyer. Um, you know, you're basically making an offer. You're going to put three percent deposit into escrow, so they have to know they they need three percent in cash to go into escrow. And if you want to make a, if it's multiple offers, it's better to put five percent. So they can, they can, they can put a bigger deposit into escrow. And what you suggest for the days? Is it seven days? So, so, uh, so the deposit needs to go into escrow within three business days. Yes. It's the only thing that's business days in the contract. Everything else is calendar days. So the deposit has to go into three, within three business days after acceptance. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, if you submit a cash offer, and you still have the appraisal contingency and it doesn't approve, can you still buy couch? If you have an appraisal contingency on a cash offer, you and you, you can back out if you do an appraisal and the appraisal doesn't come in at value. The appraisal is yeah. Right, right. See, the buyer is going to have to pay for the appraisal and the appraisal can't has to come in less than the first price. Yes. And then you can use that to back out. Although it's a, the seller doesn't accept that. No, the seller has to accept. Oh, if seller said, okay, now it's showing nine fifty instead of one million, I will give you nine fifty. Um, that's negotiation, but legally, that's, I so that's a great scenario. But technically, your buyer can still back out. Yeah, because they thought they were buying a million dollar property. They don't want a nine fifty property. That's up to them. It's personal. But then how many days usually you suggest to put for the inspection after the loan or uh, for all this kind So that is a negotiation. If there's, if there's a property that has been sitting on the market a long time and there's no competing offers, then there's no reason to shorten. There's no reason to shorten your inspection of loan or prisons. The default is 17. 17 days to inspect, 17 days for loan and appraisals. It's all 17. You don't touch anything in the contract. 17. 17 calendar days. But usually you do it 7 and 14. No, no, I mean, everything's different. It just depends. It depends what I'm competing with. Again, I want my I want my offer to be the best offer out there. So if I, I could do inspections in five days. Six days, If I had to, I could do it. Anywhere I saw was just 14 day, 7 days and 14 days. Okay. So... Okay, so pro the process is making an offer, getting it accepted. Once there's an acceptance, the buyer has to put their deposit into escrow. 3% is the standard. Um, three days, three business days. And then three business days. That means if we have an acceptance today, which is Thursday, when is the money due into escrow? Today's Thursday. We have an accepted offer today. Monday, 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 Tuesday, Friday, 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 Tuesday, 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 they probably need to have their wire done by 11 a.m. to make the 1 p.m. cut off. So just have the buyer aware they're wiring their money to escrow. Um, the cutoff time is going to be early, right? They need to do it in the morning. Or you get cashier check? Uh, usually, the, usually it's a wire for the money. So no later than Tuesday, 11 a.m.? Yes. <clears throat> Pro yes, because it takes time to get yeah. that wire going. Um, if you don't get your money into escrow on time, the seller is not going to be happy. We want to try to keep the seller happy at this point because we're going to ask the seller for some money after inspections. <laughs> we, we want to keep the seller happy, good faith. It's good faith. Everything is good faith in a contract. We won't, we, yeah. You can, you want to get it in as soon as possible. Show you're serious. Right? Yeah, show you're serious. Yeah. Show you have good faith and your, your intentions are good. Start off on the right foot. You don't want to start up with the other agent because the other agent's going to, the listing agent's going to look bad. Like, you know, he's going to be freaking out because his client's freaking out, right? Um, okay, so we do the inspections. Now, 
I said to come back to something. If we're going to back out on our investigation contingency, right? Um, and we know the reason that we're backing out. We know it. Um, I would still suggest that you not use that reason to back out. We're going to back out based upon a paragraph in the contract. So the paragraph that we're backing out on is our investigation contingency paragraph. Investigation contingency. Yeah, par paragraph 14 in the contract is the reason that we're going to give to back out. I don't want you guys backing out of contracts, but usually loan, right? Usually loan. Well, usually, usually investment. Usually investment. So um, the reason I don't want you to use a specific reason is because if you name the paragraph you're backing out on, it could be a million reasons. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. I'd rather there be a million reasons than one reason. Okay. If you back out on the paragraph and the, the seller's gonna be, first of all, the seller's gonna be upset. Let's start with that, okay? Seller just lost their buyer, they're gonna be upset. So if you use an excuse, they're gonna be really upset. Why? They're gonna say, there's nothing wrong with that. Or you don't wanna do something that can be disputed. Basically. If you back out based upon the paragraph, then they know that there's nothing they can do, right? They're gonna call their agent and say, I don't agree. Well, what do you don't agree with? They backed the balance paragraph, it could be anything. So don't try not to give a specific excuse. Why? Just use the paragraph. That's the safe, it's the safest way to do it. Your buyer will get their money back. Now, is the buyer going to get 100% of their money back? Most of the time, they will get 100% of their money back. There are some escrow companies that may charge a $200 fee, $250 fee for an escrow that doesn't go through. There are some escrow companies that will do that. Most don't do it. Is that what in-house charge? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. But I don't know. It's a question for Palin. Um, now, in the city of Los Angeles, escrow needs to order a 9A report. It's the city report. There's a $72.50 charge for that report. Um, if they order that report, it is fair for the buyer to have to pay for that. But they, the seller wouldn't have ordered it unless they had a deal. So that will be an expense maybe incurred by the buyer at that point. Could be. Sometimes not. Um, the, uh, okay, so we have our buyer. Now, the buyer's done all their inspections. And you can say to your buyer, at that point, it's a decision. You, like, you know what you're buying. You're going to move forward with the property, or you're going to back out. Or we might ask the seller to make some repairs. So there's a form called Request for Repair. And on that form called request for repair, we can ask the seller to make specific repairs. Oh, one, one investigation I forgot to add was the termite inspection. <laughs> That's a pretty important one. <laughs> that was a big, big oops. Termite. Don't forget termite. Part one, right? Uh, so there's section one, section two. Section one is actual damage. Section two is preventative maintenance. Usually, usually we can get the seller to pay for section one termite, yes. which is actual damage. Uh, termite infestation, rodent infestation, um, and wood rot is covered under section one. Um, section two is preventative. So if you go around the house and you see like an open hole on the side of the house, to screen that, we want to screen it so nothing can crawl in. That's section two, because it's preventative. What do you mean by section one section? Section so the well, section one is actual damage. That's what a seller okay. you can ask a seller to pay. RPA, you mean it's not it's Just not on the RPA, it's an investigation that we're gonna do. It used to be in the RPA, it got taken out. We're going to do that as part of our inspection. Is we'll order a termite inspection. It shows up on the report, right? Section one, section two, on yeah. The yes, yes. So they they might make recommendations to prevent future damage. We're not gonna ask the seller for that, but we are gonna ask the seller to pay for actual damage. Tenting, fumigation, wood repair. Um, okay, so now, now it's the buyer's opportunity to use a request for repair to ask for the seller to make repairs. On the same form, you could ask for a credit instead of the repairs. And you can also ask for a price reduction instead of the repairs. Or you can ask for all three. You could ask for a repair, a price reduction, and a credit. So that, that form allows you to do all of those things. The seller does not have to agree. 
the seller is in contract to sell the house at a certain price uh, and close at a certain amount of days. That's all the seller has to do. Except the, he has to close at the sale price. Now, the, the negotiation here is from the buyer's side, here's my request. If you agree to my request, I will remove my contingency. So this is the negotiation, right? Right now, the buyer can back out and not lose anything. So now the buyer is saying, I've made all my investigations. I've talked to my lender. We have the appraisal. Everything checks out, except I want $10,000 to cover all these repairs. If you agree to credit me $10,000, I will remove all my contingencies. That's the transaction. If I, once I remove all my contingencies, then if I back out, I lose my deposit. Okay, that's that's the transaction. And these are all for the house, and that if they are the house, they selling it as is. You cannot have any of these. Okay, so in in the real estate purchase contract, it has an as is clause, and all contra all purchase contracts are as is because it's as is disclosed. Seller is selling the, the seller has a right has to disclose what he knows about the property. Yeah. Right, there has to be a disclosure from the seller. Um, and the purchase is as is. Now, when we do our inspections, we're going to be finding out things that we didn't know when we wrote the offer. So this is new information, right? Because of this new information is what we're asking for: uh, credit or repair. So if I if I go into a house and there's a hole in the wall right where I walk in. I'm making my offer knowing there's a hole in the wall. I'm not going to come back later and ask the seller to repair the hole in the wall, right? But if my inspector looked behind the clothes in the closet and saw a hole in the wall, I didn't know that was there before. Now I'm going to ask the seller for a credit to, that, to make that repair. But lots of these teardown houses, the old houses that... Yeah. The agent, even they put it in the MLS and everything, and the first things they are going to say, if you want to do inspection, it's up to you. But his home is going to start. Right. So you're going to sell. You're going to make an offer. That agent is going to give you a counter offer, and it's going to say, "This home is being sold as is. No credits or repairs will be given by the seller." Yes. And your buyer is going to sign off on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> your buyer can still ask for request. <laughs> Because your buyer still has an investigation contingency and they can still back out. Right? They have their inspection contingency. So the buyer signed that. Yes, he did. Doesn't mean anything because the seller only had to sell at their purchase price to begin with. <laughs> right? It really doesn't mean anything. The seller agreed to sell at the purchase price. So if the buyer wants to back out, the buyer can back out. So the buyer is going to now, you as the buyer's agent, you're going to say, I know we signed that. But we didn't know about that. And, that, and my, my buyer is basically saying that he doesn't want it because of that. We want a credit for the repair. Now it's up to the buyer to decide. If this, now the seller may say, I'm not giving anything. Okay. Now it's up to the buyer to decide if they're going to go through the deal or not. I think that it's more if it's buyer market, but if it's hot market, same as LA, Usually you're going to try. You're going to try to get something for your buyer. You're going to try, and if the seller doesn't cooperate, the seller doesn't cooperate. Now it's up to your buyer to accept to either move forward or cancel. Now, if the now let's say we reach day eighteen, it's now day eighteen, and all our contingencies <laughs> technically expired. Right? It's now day eighteen. We had 17 days for inspection, loan, and appraisal. We didn't remove anything in writing. We didn't, we didn't sign the form called contingency removal. On day 18, the contingencies still exist. On day 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, we still have contingencies that we can back out on because they were not removed. A contingency has to be removed in writing. So there's a form called contingency mm -hmm. removal and it says, I hereby remove my loan contingency. I hereby remove my appraisal. I hereby remove my inspection contingency. There's a checkbox that says, I remove all contingencies. If that form is not signed, the buyer could still back out and get their money back, even though it's past the time. Okay. Unless the seller send the notice to her. So as the seller now, it's day 18, day 19. Buyer hasn't removed their contingencies. I want to back out as the seller. Right? Buyer's not performing. 
I want to back out. I want to sell to someone who's going to buy my house. I give. I have. I can't just cancel escrow. Notice to perform as the seller. I have to give a notice to notice to the buyer to perform. What are they performing? Contingency removal. So I'm giving the buyer a notice to perform a contingency removal. They have to sign a contingency removal. The buyer now has two days to perform. Okay. If the buyer doesn't perform after two days, so let's just say today's Monday, I get a notice to perform today on Monday. That means I have until Wednesday at midnight to <laughs> sign a contingency removal. Let's say Thursday comes, which is today, and my buyer did not remove contingencies. The seller can cancel escrow today. Wow. It can send a notice of cancellation. But they should return the money. And the money comes back to the buyer. The money goes back. Yes. Now, the notice to perform gave the seller the right to back out. It doesn't mean the seller is, is going to back out, or right? The seller can still give the notice to perform and not back out today. It's still a deal. It just gives the seller the right to cancel. But the, sell, the seller can't cancel until they give a notice to perform. <coughs> they gave the notice to perform. Now they have the right to cancel two days later. And the seller can only cancel if the buyer is not performing. There is no other way. There is the no other can... way. The seller cannot cancel. If the, buyer, if the buyer is not performing, then the seller will have an opportunity to cancel after giving a notice to perform. Um, if the now if this if the buyer is not closing escrow, that's not a notice to perform anymore. That's a demand to close. So that's a three day notice. Demand to close. Demand to close is after the contingency. Demand to close. So it doesn't matter contingencies anymore. We're talking about closing escrow now. Is the buyer putting all their money in to close the deal? If the buyer is not completing the deal with money in escrow, that's not a notice to perform. It's called a demand to close. It's a different form, just specifically for closing. Demand to close, three-day notice. Now we're talking about a seller who wants to keep the deposit, right? Okay, there have to be damages to keep a deposit. It's called liquidated damages. So hopefully your buyer signed initial liquidated damages. Liquidated damages is a pre-agreed upon amount of damages. In real estate, it's really hard to determine what damages are. So it's agreed up front, 3%. Now you, Hedy, you had said 5%. You want a buyer to put 5% into escrow. Yes. If liquidated damages is initialed by both parties, that clause says that the amount of liquidated damages, which is the pre-agreed amount that the sub buyer will lose, is the deposit actually paid not to exceed 3%. So even though your buyer put 5% in, the maximum they can lose is 3 That's right. Yeah. So that's what the liquidated damages clause says. It says... It's a, the deposit is the amount actually paid. They will lose the amount actually paid, not to exceed 3%. So sometimes as listing agents, we're going to get uh, offers from uh, wholesalers and things. They're, they only want to put a $5,000 deposit or a $10,000 deposit, which is nothing compared to 3%, right? On my counter offers as a listing agent, it always says three, deposit to be 3%. I always counter purchase price to be this number, my second line deposit to be 3% of purchase price. So I want to make sure there's a full 3% in escrow. Yeah. Right. If you have a $5,000 deposit, that's the maximum your seller is going to get if they back out. Because mm -hmm. it's the deposit actually paid not to exceed 3%. So always make sure as a listing agent, you have 3% in escrow. That's good because usually when to make the offer attractive, you put more, five, six percent off. You can, you can. Now, now let's keep in mind that escrow can't do anything without agreement from the buyer and the seller. So the seller is not going to be in such a hurry to give any money back and they have to sign off in order for escrow to release the money. But the buyer will want the 3%. I mean, the seller will want it, right? So I'm sure the seller won't have a problem giving back the other 2% if they're getting three, right? now. The buyer, the seller at this point, probably, I mean, we can't give legal advice, but there have to be damages in order for a seller to keep a deposit. If a seller resells the property to another buyer at the same price or more, there's no damage, 
right? So just keep that in mind. There have, there have to be damages. <laughs> the seller decides not to sell their property. If so, if you have a seller that takes the property off the market, that there are damages. There are because in it means if it's that imagine it's a seller, buyer still is very interested to buy this property, but before removing contingency, the seller changed his mind or said there's some issue with the title, for example. Um, I don't want to sell it. There's a problem on the seller side. Problem or he changed his mind, he's looking for some excuse to not sell well, the home. So how do I force a sale is what you're asking. How do I force the seller to sell? No, nothing. But I just say that the damage to the buyer that who put his money waiting for this property, for example, for 10 well, days. As a buyer, do I still want to go through the do I still want the deal? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to sue. I, mean, I, I, I can't give legal advice. I will. The legal advice I'm giving my buyer at this point is you need to contact your attorney, right? And the attorney is probably going to file a lawsuit for specific performance to sell the property. The seller has to sell us. So they need to perform the act of sale. They have to sign a grant deed and give it to escrow. And, that, and then title reports that grant deed. So we're suing the seller to perform, to sell the property. Um, the, the attorney will probably file on public record something called a lease pendants. It's a pending lawsuit on the property, which will prevent the seller from selling that property to anybody else. And that will appear on title uh, as while this whole thing is getting sorted out. So there will be a cloud on title now preventing the sale of that property. Um, means this has to go through that means if the buyer is out of the state or out of the US, it's so I'm just saying if the seller is not selling, yeah. Now what can happen? A judge, how's a judge going to enforce a sale? The judge may say to the seller, um, for every day you don't don't give that signed grantee, you're fined five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. Right? So every day that's not signed. There's a fine. That's how a judge can enforce it. It's going to get to a financial point where the seller just is like, okay, I'll sell. Right? The buyer should pay the attorney fee. And yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be true because I have this scenario that the seller changed his mind because it's it was some family issues, yeah. and then the business. buyer yeah. put the money, transferring money to US, took agents, cost yeah. them too awesome. much. It's a loss. Awesome. Then he changed his mind. That's a loss. Awesome. All right, so that's that's really the whole buyer process. I mean, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, what was the form that was like the seller could get three percent? There was any damages? So, the, so on the purchase agreement, on the original offer, there are two places that require initials that aren't on the bottom. So every place, every every page on the purchase contract gets initialed at the bottom. Yeah. But there's one page that has three initials on it. It is liquidated damages. Liquidated damages paragraph, the arbitration paragraph. So those are those are the two paragraphs that require initials by both parties um, in order to be enforceable. What was the second one then? Arbitration. So we'll talk real quick about those two things. Um, liquidated damages is a pre-agreed upon amount that the buyer will lose if they don't perform, if they don't go through with the deal after they remove all of their contingency. Once they sign off, no more loan, no more appraisal, no more investigation, they sign off. That's important for them to sign off because the seller is moving out of the house. If the seller is putting all their stuff on a truck and packing up and moving out, they don't want to all of a sudden get a phone call, oh, we changed our mind, right? The seller just bought a new house, or they signed a new lease, or they, you know, they're moved out of the house. I mean, the war, they don't want a phone call, buyers backing out. Now there's damages, right? So the seller can't proceed with their plans until the buyer removes contingencies. Once the buyer removes contingencies, the seller is comfortable knowing if they back out, they lose their deposit, right? Um, okay, now when we write our offer, our buyer is going to initial those two paragraphs. California law says that if that offer gets accepted, 
but the seller didn't initial those two paragraphs. Okay. We wrote our offer. Buyer initialed those two paragraphs, liquidated damages and arbitration. The offer goes. The seller accepts our offer, initials every page, but not those two paragraphs. We now have an accepted offer. It's, it's an enforceable contract, but those two paragraphs are not part of the contract because they weren't initialed by both parties. Mm. So now we have a contract with no liquidated damages and no arbitration. That's a separate amount in the escrow, right? Liquidated damage, they have to put it in the escrow. Liquidated damages is just, it's a pre, it's a pre agreed upon amount of damages. It's an amount. Three, it's, it's the actual deposit, it's the deposit right. actually paid not to exceed 3%. Oh, not, not to exceed. Liquidated damages limits the buyer's risk to 3%. So the buyer's risk is limited to 3%. It's going to lose his initial deposit, actually. Mm -hmm. If you have a, can't lose more than it. You can't lose more than it. And then, and then arbitration is arbitration means there's a problem between the buyer and the seller. There's a dispute. It goes to mediation, which is not binding. Mediation is part of the contract, no matter what. Mediation means they're going to try to work it out with a with a mediator. If they can't come to an agreement at mediation, it will go to arbitration. Arbitration is binding. It's instead of going to court. How about lawsuit? Well, we're talking about arbitration. Arbitration is it's like a media, it's like a mediation, but it's binding. So it's usually it's usually like an off-duty judge or retired judge. You can buy those. An attorney. I mean, why would somebody agree to an arbitration? I, I wouldn't if I'm them. a seller, I want arbitration. You do? I do. Yeah, but not why do I why do I want my property? No, no, no. The years. buyer, the buyer says, listen, they're gonna go and pay extra to the guy, and then the so can buy as, judges. as a buyer. I don't know. Uh, I would sue. Arbitration will help keep you out of court. I would sue and, and tie up the property on this. Okay, but as a seller, I might want. I don't. I might want arbitration as a seller for sure. And I'm not going to accept the offer but without that. the buyer initialing that. Oh, you initialing that. Okay, fine. All right. So the, the only pushback I've ever had on arbitration is usually when my clients are attorneys, and they say I don't want to agree to it now because I can agree to it in the future. The response to that is the other party doesn't need to agree to it in the future. Sure, yeah. Both people need to agree to it up front in order for it to be part of it. If you can. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, look, the buyer, the buyer puts their money in at the end of escrow, the lender puts theirs in, and that's it. You close. I mean, what's going to happen is right before closing, your buyer will have the opportunity to come in the property. It's called verification of property condition. The buyer will just come in and make sure the property is in the same exact condition as it was when they went into contract. If there's a problem, like you go in right before closing and the curtains are missing, that's your part, it's part of the contract. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, stop closing, but you can say to the seller, we need the curtains. We're going to, we're going to tell escrow to withhold $2,000 until the curtains are put back. Or if you, if you see something got damaged, you can you can ask escrow to hold some of the seller's proceeds to cover it until the seller repairs it, or you can work something out. But you don't have to stop closing. Go through with closing, mm -hmm. hold enough money to do that, whatever it is, yeah. in escrow until it gets sold. All right. So you don't you just don't have to stop the whole closing because your buyer wants to close because the lender, the lender's ready to put their money in escrow. We want the lender to put their money in. All right, guys. That's, that's yeah, of course. Uh, when it's like a multiple uh, offer situation, I know that there is a trick that some agents um, oh, like. Tell us, we love tricks. You know which one is that? The one that they submit a cash offer with only inspection contingency, no appraisal, no okay. loan. But on the back, the buyer is trying to get a loan. Okay, that's fine. So if I'm a listing agent and I see an offer come in cash and the buyer wants to get a loan, I'm totally okay with that. It's fine. But there has to be enough cash in the bank to close the loan, yes. close the deal. Yes. Yeah, and I know that there should be a term on the RPA. Yeah. So when I write that offer, I'm writing a cash offer. And in additional terms, I say uh, seller to cooperate with an appraiser if buyer wants to get a loan. Yeah. Because all, all I need from the seller is to let the appraiser in the door. That's all I need if the buyer wants to get a loan. Right. Yeah, but if you don't have the appraisal contingency, then the seller doesn't need to give you the permission for that. 
Well, that's why I'm writing the term. Seller to cooperate with an appraiser. If seller to cooperate with an appraiser if the buyer wants to get on. But that's a, it's not a it's not a contingency. I just want them to open the door and let the appraiser in. That's all. Yeah. yeah. But the they don't let the appraiser in, I can't get the loan. Yeah, but if the seller asks that if it's the cash purchase. You can write, you can write. Uh, seller agrees to cooperate with appraiser if buyer decides to get a loan. Loan is not a contingency of this agreement, and buyer will close in cash if the loan cannot be completed on time. Yeah, but the, the point is if the loan, the, the loan is not approved. The buyer has to close in cash. Yeah. yeah the cash. Talk, that's why I said yeah, the, buyer, the buyer has to close the cash. Yeah, but that's back out. But they can pack back out on the inspection. Yes, they can use their inspection. Okay. Yes. There is a term that I mean, was told before that the buyer reserved the right to obtain alternative financial means at his own sole discretion. Yes, so I also that said that. We just need to sell the That's not a good Yeah, because sometimes it's happening. Mm -hmm. I can say that my buyer had enough money to buy it as a full cash, but the thing is the when you want to close everything, the title said if it's full cash, they are going to report it to IRS. And then he said, okay, stop it now. We, we, we came back, everything we agree again, and we got just um, 100,000, 200,000 loans. Because we got a loan, then they, they don't need to report it. But, but he was agreeing <laughs> that to pay it cash, and he had the okay. cash, but just because of that, the title sent the last letter that you have to sign, and they, can, they are allowed to report everything. And he said, okay, wait, I will get loan. Because on the 3 million properties, we got, I think, 100,000 uh, loan. That's why it's always- Go get those buyers, guys. <laughs> but it's another trick that lots of, lots of agents tricks. doing it. Yeah, that was, that was... It's so hard that it was a property that we put the offer cash higher than the asking price. Yeah. But this agent, listing agent and his her son, I don't know how they deal together. They sold the home. The home came out less than the our offer price. But we couldn't do anything. I don't know if she never So here's here's, here's the issue. The seller can always do whatever they want. Yes. Yeah. That, the seller that, agent, yeah. actually. The seller, yeah, yeah. because we never, we never know that. The seller can always do whatever. We never they know that if they really present our offer, how they present it, how they treat yeah. it. And then, then she said, yeah, he chose that. It's not my thing. We had 10 offers, and he chose something that 300,000 less. For me, I don't believe him, but they didn't. Yeah, something happened. We don't know how. JJ, what was that for again where the seller could give to the buyer request, after the 17 days? Request for repair. Oh, the notice to perform. Notice to perform. Notice to perform. So there's two different notices to perform. There's a notice to buyer to perform, and there's a notice to seller to perform. If the seller doesn't give disclosures on time, the seller has seven days to give disclosures. If they don't give disclosures on time, we have to give the notice to seller to perform to give disclosures. Yeah. If we have an uncooperative seller that oh. immediately changed their mind, we have to give them a notice to perform on the disclosures, notice to perform. And that's seven days. Two days. It always, it always gives two days to the other party to perform. So, when the, when the, when the, you say the multiple offer, you say the safety offer on the property, you would say that, would you say that? I would reserve, the, I would let the buyer keep my initial deposit if I don't go through the deal, or I would buy the property at a certain amount above asking price, limited to that much. What which is more powerful to get that? I mean, I don't know. It's all strategy. Mm -hmm. all strategy. Connection with that. You're going to do whatever you need to do to get the, your offer accepted. Yeah. Connection with so you're, you're going to tell your buyer nothing else. You know, this is what the listing agent is telling me. If 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 we can do this and this and this, he'll accept our offer. And then it's up to the buyer. Yeah, that's right. right. All we can do is direct our buyer yeah. to put yeah. the deal together. If our buyer doesn't want to cooperate, you know. Yeah. yeah. Just connection with the seller agent. If yeah, you yeah, you have to be nice to the seller. Yeah. 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 Yeah
a relationship is working. I want to. I want to be an angel in my agent. That's for when you're listing agent, you have all the power. Buyer and then always are.